Witam Panią Profesor bardzo serdecznie. Nazywam się Zofia Pyszewska. Ten wywiad jest dla mnie szczególnie ważny, dlatego że sama jestem osobą jąkającą się, więc wydaje mi się, że bardzo wiele pieniądze z tej rozmowy z Panią. Bardzo dziękuję, że zgodziła się Pani ze mną porozmawiać. Ponieważ jest Pani gościem, gościem honorowym na jutrzejszej konferencji, moje pierwsze pytanie będzie właśnie dotyczyło Pani fascynacji tematem jąkania. Skąd ona się w ogóle u Pani wzięła? Well, it's a little bit of a story, so stop me if I get going too long. But uh, when I was first in speech pathology as a student, in the very, on the very first day of my stuttering program, or fluency uh, disorders class, we call it, Dr. Anna Boberg showed us a video of uh, a client, of some clients before therapy and after therapy. He was a person who stutters. He had started the Institute for Stutter and Treatment and Research where I work with uh, Deborah Cully. And uh, so they had been giving treatment programs. They were three week intensive treatment programs or individual therapy. So he started to talk a little bit about stuttering, but he basically said, let me show you something. So he showed us the pre-treatment video of some uh, individuals. They were adults. And I was really, really, really touched, um, really deeply moved by the struggle. I actually couldn't believe how much struggle um, someone could have in just saying very simple things like their name or where they were from, let alone just be able to talk a little bit about themselves or the kind of work they do. So uh, I was, you know, he, it really caught my attention. And then um, Dr. Boberg talked about the impact of study on his life and his story, which is truly amazing. Someday I hope to uh, write out his story, but that's another life. Um, so then he uh, told us about his, his life and then he showed us the video of someone, of some clients after the treatment program and I just went, oh wow. It was just amazing to see the transformation, to see how they were talking about themselves, not just the speech, but about their, how they, their manner, um, how open they were, how excited they were to be sharing their thoughts and their opinions. Uh, it was, it was really amazing. It was, sort of like a, a transformation just before my eyes within the course of, you know, maybe 45 minutes. And so it's not very often in life that we get to see something so amazing, so transformative. And it was really then at that moment that I just thought, that is what I want to do in my career. I want to work with people who stutter. And I started studying really hard made sure I got good marks in stuttering. And then um, I joined ISTAR, the Institute for Stuttering Treatment and Research in 1988 as a speech pathologist. And I had done, I had, had done, yes, I had done two practica. And the first one was with children who stutter. They were uh, nine and 10. And it was truly amazing. Uh, it was wonderful to work with them and, and to teach them the speech techniques and to talk about all kinds of attitudinal things and help them learn how to answer questions in class and help them, uh, you know, be proud of themselves. And then I thought, hmm, I didn't know where my career was going to go. And I thought, well, if I'm going to work with people who stutter, because I didn't know then that I was going to work for the Institute, I thought I better do another practicum. So I worked with adults. And uh, again, it was just a most amazing experience. Of all my practica, these two just absolutely still stand out in my mind. I still see the clients. I still hear, I hear the stories in my head. And uh, it's still all these years later. Absolutely inspiring. Pani profesor, osoby z osobami jąkającymi się oraz niestety również moje własne doświadczenia pokazały, że społeczeństwo w Polsce wciąż mało wie na temat jąkania. Jak to wy wy wygląda w Kanadzie? Czy ludzie wiedzą, co pomaga, co utrudnia komunikację z osobą jąkającą się? I ogólnie, czy osobom jąkającym się jest bardzo trudno w Kanadzie? I jakie 
trudności oni spotykają. Um, so what I think I'll do is I'll start with the last part of the question and work forward. Um, so uh, the difficulties that people who stutter in Canada face, I think, are the same around the world. Absolutely. And I've learned this from my own work with people who've come for therapy from different parts of the world, from the International Stuttering Association conferences, the um, other conferences of people who stutter, when they come together and share their experiences, they, they are very, very similar. I think there's kind of two main categories of responses, and you can certainly tell me if I'm right or not. Uh, I think one is the how the listeners react to stuttering. Yeah, yes. yeah. And uh, so in my experience, uh, I kind of think about it from the point of view of the adult who stutters and the child who stutters. And there's a change, I think, as uh, one gets older. So for the children who stutter, my experience with them is that in school, they're often teased about their stuttering. Their, their stutter is imitated. And I think uh, because they're in a classroom, they're in a school, where kids know them more after the first day of school that you know it's it often is mean-spirited or it can be means it often is mean-spirited um, you know after that first uh, meeting when the kids see you stutter they might act with surprise some of them but then uh, if there's teasing and you know it can be mean-spirited after that I think for the adults so as as we become adults uh, generally, adults are thinking a little bit more about how they react to someone, but I still think there's that element of surprise when uh, when you meet somebody new, and you know, especially in stores, first day of classes, uh, meeting new colleagues. If they don't know that you stuttered, they can be surprised, and it's not necessarily that they want to be mean spirited. But they sometimes just react out, you know, they'll, you know, laugh a little. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't imitate laughing real well. <laughs> but they'll laugh a little. And, um, you know, sometimes they'll imitate the stutter more out of, you know, not, not being sure what to do. They, you know, they feel a bit of discomfort. They don't know what's going on. And sometimes they think the person is just making a joke. Is that right? Yeah, the person who stutters just making a joke, and no, it's not. So um, the listener reactions, I think, is is uh, a big problem for all people who stutter in all societies, all countries. And then I think the other thing is schoolwork and jobs uh, in school. You may have done this; they don't know, but we know that children will not. Uh, answer questions, they have difficulty doing presentations, even though the children in the classroom for the most part uh, can be very supportive. They'll sometimes be that one child who will laugh and then a few kids laugh and you know then the others join in. Um, and then also uh, you know they might put a or if the teacher asks them a question they might give the wrong answer. Yeah, it's an answer that they can say, not the right answer, even though they know you know the answer. So I think that's very common. And then I think in jobs for adults, uh, some of the people that I work with say, I can't get past the interview. And uh, sometimes, even though they will tell the uh, person who's interviewing that they stutter, the employer or prospective employer just kind of goes into this thinking that many people do that people who stutter if they can't speak fluently like everybody else they can't think like everybody else they're not as intelligent as everybody else and so uh, and we know of course that you know people who stutter have all ranges of intelligence all ranges of abilities all ranges of emotions etc so I think that's a common problem around the world. I guess I would like to know if that's the case. I'm, is that the case in Poland as well? I think yeah, tak, właściwie z mojego doświadczenia też wiem, że, oh. że um, te trudności, które spotkały mnie właśnie przez to moje jąkanie, 
Są dokładnie takie same, jakie pani profesor wymieniła. To znaczy zdarzało mi się w szkole jeszcze przed rozpoczęciem terapii, że nie zgłaszałam się, chociaż znałam odpowiedź, że wolałam siedzieć cicho i powiedzieć, że nie, nie umiem albo się nie nauczyłam, mimo tego, że siedziałam nad tym cały poprzedni dzień. Wiadomo, nauczyciele niestety w moim przypadku też nie byli wspierający, to znaczy bardzo często na języku polskim moje zacięcie się, czyli zablokowanie było traktowane jako to, że nie umiem czegoś przeczytać albo że nie wiem, co mam odpowiedzieć. Nikt jakby nie dawał mi szansy, żebym w spokoju to słowo wypowiedziała, którego nie mogłam ominąć ani zastąpić innym, co też bardzo często stosowałam. Nie zgłaszałam się na, na lekcjach, byłam bardzo nieśmiała i bardzo zamknięta w sobie. Na szczęście terapia otworzyła mnie i teraz zgłaszam się częściej. Na pewno jeszcze nie tak bardzo często, jak bym chciała i mam nadzieję, że, że jeszcze nad tym popracuję. Natomiast wydaje mi się, że osiągnęłam, osiągnęłam już bardzo, bardzo wiele i też reakcje innych już tak bardzo mnie nie martwią. Kiedyś myślałam, że inne osoby oceniają mnie właśnie przez ten pryzmat, że jąkam się. Wydawało mi się, że nikt mnie, mnie przez to nie lubi, że, że jestem nieakceptowana. Teraz już wiem, że, że nie jestem tak oceniana. Jeżeli ktoś mnie tak ocenia, to po prostu nie jest wart tego, żebym się z nim jakoś bliżej przyjaźniła. It's very, very difficult in school and you talk about the teachers. So in Canada, because uh, in Alberta anyway, my province, because we've done a lot of work with uh, stuttering education, which I'll talk about a bit more, I think the teachers are much more aware now and speech pathologists are also going into the schools and uh, teaching not just the teacher of the class who has a child who stutters but the whole school. So I think the class climate in Canada or in Alberta anyway might be improved but it was uh, the experience of a little boy that I worked with. He was in about grade three or four and the teacher did not understand stuttering and the kids did not understand stuttering. And at the end of the therapy program, it was a four-week therapy program, he came to us from another province. He talked about being teased the very last moment of the therapy. And it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. So that's what motivated me to get involved in this work. So, yeah. And I think that um, I just want to say, wow, good for you. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. Um, yeah. And I think that one of the things that you mentioned, I think that's really, really important is, you know, uh, uh, realizing that there are people out there who will still be mean. And then you make the selection, or you make the decision yourself as to whether or not there are people that you want to continue to uh, associate with. And sometimes you're in a situation where you have to continue. And yes, then you have to learn how to make the best of it yourself, because we can't always change other people. But that also is life, isn't it? Yeah, that also is life, and so, yeah, good on, good for you. Let me say, good on you. What What do you do now? Are you studying? Are you working? Studiuję psychologię. Zaczęłam rok temu. Tak będę na drugim roku. And how long will your program be? To są pięcioletnie studia magisterskie. Five years. Okay, very exciting. And will you be clinical, do you think? Or will you do research, or you don't know yet? Niestety jeszcze nie wiem. W zasadzie od zawsze miałam być lekarzem. Jakby będąc w liceum, myślałam, że jednak medycyna będzie dla mnie. Natomiast stało się inaczej. Nie żałuję tego. Ja wychodzę z założenia, że wszystko w życiu dzieje się w jakimś określonym celu, więc Na razie bardzo cieszę się, że, studi że studiuję psychologię, staram się wyciągnąć z tych studiów jak najwięcej, a co będzie potem, to jeszcze nie wiem. Zobaczymy, co życie pokaże. I wish you all the best. It's a very exciting path, I think you're on. Yes.
Więc uważa Pani, że społeczeństwo kanadyjskie, generalnie nie tylko nauczyciele, wie dużo na temat jąkania? Czy może prowadzone są jakieś działania, żeby dowiedziało się jeszcze więcej? Ok, well, first I'll just talk about the King's Speech movie. Um, so, the King's Speech movie really did uh, so much for stuttering awareness in Canada in particular, in the US and I know in Australia for sure. All of my colleagues were getting many, many, many phone calls from the media and uh, even in, in my own personal life, people were asking me questions, even though they knew that I was working with stuttering all of my life, all of my speech pathology life, uh, they now were asking more questions. So I think the King's speech helped Canadians understand more about stuttering, but it's hard to translate, you know, a movie, a life in a movie into real life and to really understand the true impact of stuttering on the individual. So I don't think you, maybe they know a little bit more about stuttering in countries in which the King's Speech hasn't been shown. Uh, but I, you know, that will only last for a period of time for the people who have seen the movie. Uh, there are also the, um, different websites which I'll talk more about. Um, well, maybe I'll talk more about them now. I'm not sure if I'm going into the next question or not. But um, so there are uh, educational initiatives by uh, the Canadian Stuttering Association. They have a website, but not everybody will go to that website to look for information. There's the uh, International Stuttering Association that I mentioned before. Uh, there's also a few more things, the, um, the speech uh, language pathology training programs. I'm sure it's the same here as well. They always learn about how to make uh, uh, presentations in schools and also to the public. And then we also have a, well, is it a national, uh, international stuttering awareness day? Do you have that here as well? Yeah. Yes, you do. Yes, of course. So the international... <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't be international. <laughs> so, yeah, so the International Stuttering Awareness Association, sorry, International Stuttering Awareness Day, there'll be activities across uh, Canada. In my own institute, we will have activities where we invite people in. and We, we have uh, pe uh, people who stutter, who uh, we've had in treatment, or people who stutter who haven't had treatment. Uh, or haven't had treatment for a long time, come in and talk to people about their stuttering. It's There's a formal part, there's an informal part, so there's lots of interaction. Um, so I think those kinds of things are done pretty much around the world. And, uh... Jeżeli chodzi o, o pytanie dotyczące międzynarodowej konferencji, e, no jutro będę miała swój taki poważny e, 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 debiut, gdyż e, będę współprowadziła jeden z warsztatów, a tak naprawdę pierwszy raz wezmę udział w czymś tak wielkim i mam nadzieję, że mi się uda, że będę zadowolona. Ta konferencja w ogóle niesie ze sobą dużo wyzwań dla mnie, ponieważ wywiad z panią profesor, jak i wystąpienie na warsztacie będzie tak naprawdę moim debiutem w takiej roli. Mam nadzieję, że sprostam wyzwaniu. Jeżeli chodzi o film, jeszcze chciałam tylko dodać, że obejrzałam go, natomiast musiałam bardzo, bardzo długo czekać, ponieważ na początku nie byłam chyba na to gotowa. Nie bardzo nie lubiłam oglądać ludzi, którzy się jąkają, bo widziałam siebie, a teraz już, już wiem, że, że ten film naprawdę pokazuje, że można z jąkaniem żyć i że to wcale nie jest żadne takie wielkie ograniczenie. Kolejne pytanie będzie dotyczyło Pani w stosunku do osób jąkających się. Czy w kontaktach z takimi osobami coś Panią zaskoczyło? A może te kontakty czegoś Panią nauczyły? Yes. <laughs> yes and yes and yes. So I think that um, firstly I want to say that I have all of my career, 27 years in working with people who stutter, preschoolers up to 78, 79, 80 years old. Uh, there isn't one person that I've worked with that hasn't inspired me. And um, it's, uh, it's a privilege and it's an honor. 
to have had these experiences all of my career. I could never, ever have expected my career to be so rewarding and to work with so many amazing people who, as you know, have struggles and who face those struggles and then have triumphs. And to be part of that change process is um, is is deeply. Hmm. Now my English is falling apart. <laughs> it's um. It's just been a real honor and privilege, and I am so grateful for uh, having had this opportunity all my life, all my all my speech pathology life. So I'll talk about I think maybe three three things that inspired me. The first was the little boy who was teased uh, in school, who only told us about it at the end of four weeks of therapy. And so I decided, oh, I want to see what we have in the literature, what kind of resources we have to help teachers understand stuttering, and then also to help kids who stutter deal with teasing and bullying. How should it be done? And I was quite young in my career. I was a little bit older in my life, but a little bit younger in my career. And uh, I was very young in my career. It was only my, my actual first year of working. And uh, so I looked to see what kind of uh, stuttering education materials we had that were practical, that were easy to use. There wasn't very much. Uh, you know, we, we, it, and this was before websites. You know, so we had the Stuttering Foundation of America uh, resources. We had our own resources, but you know, you had to mail for them. You had to really make lots of effort to get them. And then I looked in the bullying literature, and there was not very much that was really practical for teachers to be able to take, learn quickly, and then apply in the classroom. There were books, you know. Uh, books you read, 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 and then you had to make your own lesson plans. So I uh, thought, hmm, we need stuttering education, we need bullying education, we need people, uh, we need information to help children understand what bullying is, to understand that teasing is in fact bullying. And then I went to teachers and I said, if I develop an education program about stuttering to be used in your health curriculum, will you use it? And they said, well, probably not, only if I have a child who stutters in the classroom. So then I thought, hmm, well, and then I was looking at the bullying literature, and I was initially looking at the bullying more for my own clinical work, and then the ideas came, I thought, oh, teachers need uh, resources to help them, uh, help the children deal with bullying, to change the class climate. I will embed the stuttering information into the bullying program. And that way it'll get widely used, not just in the classroom where there's a child who stutters. So that was, a, that was uh, one of my big, big first inspirations. I was determined to help that child um, and, uh, and all the children that I work with have more, more uh, supportive classroom environments. So uh, this is the program that I developed. It's called Teasing and Bullying Unacceptable Behavior. It has education about stuttering. It has lots of education about bullying, what bullying is, uh, how you can respond to it. What, uh, and in terms of the stuttering, what stuttering is, it's a physical problem, how can you help a student who stutters? And so I'm leaving this with my uh, colleague, Kajia Vauscheska, and uh, her colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Gatska, and it will be an example for them to look at and see uh, if there's anything in there that can be helpful in Poland inspiration came a little bit later, or the second, I guess, surprise came a, uh, just a little bit later, maybe in my second year of working, and 
Uh, so we were working with a client, he was probably around 55 at the time, and he did very well in therapy, both in learning the speech techniques and in, in learning about stuttering and talking about it and accepting himself. And, uh, you know, he was experiencing being able to express himself for the first time in his life, as, as you will know about and and he sent a letter we had many many years of contact and in fact 27 years later we still have emails once in a while and um, he does a lot of uh, education work he goes around his province and talks whatever he can to help people understand what stuttering is and to um, help uh, children get to therapy uh, help parents understand what therapy is um, and that kind of thing. But anyway, uh, shortly after he went home, he sent a letter to say that for the first time in his life, in his married life with his children, he had had a serious conversation with his children. I was blown away. I was really, um, really surprised. I really, you know, I was learning about stuttering in my work. Um, I had a cousin who stuttered, but I didn't know her real well. And in fact, I didn't even remember that she stuttered because she passed away. I didn't even remember she stuttered until I wrote my final stuttering exam. And I was driving home and I thought, right, I know more about stuttering than I just learned in the books. And I remembered a few things. So hearing that man talk about how he was having a serious conversation with his children for the first time was a real surprise. And also he talked about how, how he would always get his wife to make his business phone calls and whatnot. Uh, and she was so much involved in his life. Uh, they worked together, but she was doing a lot of the things for him. And then in their relationship, it had to change. So he started making his own phone calls for his business, and his wife had to make a change. So that really helped me understand that uh, stuttering can powerfully affect relationships and how they develop and how they change over time. I don't know, I, um, you know if that rings if you've had similar experiences or know of people who've had similar experiences, probably, hey? Tak, jeżeli chodzi o moją terapię, to e, zawsze miałam wsparcie ze strony rodziców i mojej siostry, natomiast e, rzeczywiście po terapii zmieniło się troszkę. E, większość swoich spraw załatwiam sama, e, już e, nie widzę takiego wielkiego problemu w zatelefonowaniu gdzieś. Staram się też nie wyręczać, niemniej w jakichś tam sytuacjach, jak na przykład zamówienie w restauracji, bo wiem, że, że to są takie sytuacje, z którymi ja się muszę oswoić, bo nie będę na pewno do końca życia prosiła kogoś, żeby zamówił coś za mnie. Mam nadzieję, że, że kiedyś już będę na takim etapie, że nie będzie mi to sprawiało żadnego problemu, natomiast w tym momencie już nikim się, się nie wyręczam i na pewno mojej rodzinie żyje się w tym o wiele łatwiej, ponieważ jestem bardziej otwarta i i już nie uciekam przed takimi ciężkimi sytuacjami. Learning, big learning is, is very much related to what you've just said. So in terms of parents uh, and preschoolers, uh, firstly, I think in, in my experience uh, at, at the Institute, in my treatment, I knew that preschoolers were experiencing some negative reactions in their schools, in their kindergarten. And secondly, I knew that parents uh, felt great uh, hurt. They felt they, they would feel their child stuttering. I remember one mom saying to me very early in my career, she said, uh, and actually it came after therapy uh, was going along and things were getting better. And I asked her how things were going. And we always rate was stuttering better uh, than before or worse than, than the previous work or the same as the previous week and her response was well it's better and 
I am no longer feeling his stutters. So all of my years, I knew that stuttering is, is hard for the parents too. And then when I did my PhD in Australia, at the Australian Stuttering Research Center with Mark Onslow and, well, with Ann Pacman and Mark Onslow, um, we developed a questionnaire that we sent out to parents of preschoolers who stutter. And we want, I wanted to learn more about how stuttering was affecting these little ones in school, or in kindergarten, because we didn't have much in our literature about that at that time. And so I asked the parents, uh, you know, does your child talk more or less uh, in school? Uh, you know, there were lots of questions about how the child was functioning in school. And then I also asked, I asked, does your child get teased in kindergarten? And of course the response was yes. Uh, not About 27% of the parents said that yes, their little preschooler was teased. And we didn't have that information in our literature. And I think the general assumption was that if a parent didn't report that the child was being teased and didn't report that, you know, they saw their child being, uh, being ignored or, uh, you know, being uh, excluded, then I think the general assumption was that the preschoolers were doing okay. But I wasn't sure. So in my PhD, I one of the things I did was I developed this questionnaire, and uh, the last two questions was just before we finished up the questionnaire, I thought, I haven't asked the parents how they feel. So I had two questions. One was, um, does stuttering, has stuttering affected your relationship with your child? And then just more broadly, has stuttering affected you emotionally? Well, the parents wrote a lot. They were very concerned about their children, um, how they would do in school, how they would do in life in general, how they would do in high school, university, how they would do as adults in the workplace. The question about uh, has, stuttering effect, has stuttering affected your relationship with your child? Only four people said yes out of 77. So that was good news. But the one, one per two were just kind of, you know, it, they weren't positive, they weren't negative. Uh, but one was positive. The parent said, I feel much closer to my child because of his stuttering. The other parent said, I, and this was after the child had been in therapy, they had been in therapy together, the mother wrote, I now have the mother-child bond that I have longed for. Today was a very good day. I was really, really surprised. I actually didn't expect to get any yes responses to that question. Um, well, I should say it differently. I didn't expect that stuttering could have the potential to affect that bond because the mother-child bond is the most sacred bond in our lives. It's, it go, it's just the most sacred. And for stuttering to have the potential for a mother to not know her child as a preschooler, it was just profoundly, profoundly touching. I was, I cried. <laughs> I cried. I still cry. Um, so that was a real inspiration, or a real uh, profound learning. And from that, uh, I've written about it and published uh, some, uh, a manuscript with my colleagues um, and I think it really showed me how important it is to uh, address the parents concerns in therapy we did we always did but parents mostly want to get to what can I do for my child they want to do the best for their children but I think now we know more that we need to give parents time to um, to deal with their 
emotions, their struggles, their hopes, their fears. They're very much part of therapy now. Uh, not so much in the earlier days when I was a younger clinician. Uh, parents watched therapy then and did homework. Now parents in our in our institute and, and I think probably around the world are much more involved in the therapy. But yeah, it was just an amazing learning to to know the extent to which stuttering could affect relationships. Mamy pani jeszcze ostatnie pytanie. Czy mogłaby pani udzielić jakiejś uniwersalnej rady osobom i jągającym się zarówno u nas w Polsce, w Kanadzie, jak i, i na całym świecie. Jakiej rady by im Pani udzieliła? Ok, well I first must say that I would like your opinion on what I say. <laughs> Whether or not you agree, because I think it's really important. Um, so I think the first thing, uh, well actually let me also say this, I would like to add some um, thoughts for speech pathologists as well uh, as, let me just think, listeners in general. Okay, so let's firstly do a deal with people who stutter, individuals who stutter. Um, so I think just the very first thing I would say to any client, any person that I work with is, say what you want to say whether or not you stutter. It's so important to share your thoughts and ideas, and I can't know you. I can't know who you are, I can't know about uh, your abilities, your likes, your dislikes, um, you know, your thoughts about how the world should change or not change. I can't know that unless you tell me. And I think it, yes, it is difficult when you're stuttering and you can't get the words out, but um, I just that would be my first advice is say what you want to say whether or not you stutter and find those listeners who are willing to be patient who are interested because not everybody is interested in what I have to say I've learned that <laughs> um, so I think that's the same um, and then uh, related to that is is you have a voice we all have our voices, but you have a voice. And I think that, so this is getting quite personal in terms of my thoughts, which not everybody will agree with, but I really do think that we all have a responsibility to our communities, uh, to society, to um, share uh, our thoughts about about how the world should be, how it could be. and. You, you, the vo everybody's voice is important, you know, whether or you stutter, whether you have other uh, challenges, um, I think everybody's voice is important, so you have a voice, share your voice. Um, we can't know and love, as a listener, as a, as a colleague, as a friend, uh, I can know and love you more when I know more about you. Um, then I think don't, I would say, don't fight with your stutter. The more you, you know, fight and tense, the more stuttering happens and the more anxious one gets and then the listener is anxious and then everybody is anxious. Uh, so, you know, don't fight with it. Uh, if you've had therapy, use your techniques as best you can. I know that people who've had therapy will choose to use their techniques some of the time, not all the time, or some that's just, there's no option. They are using their techniques and that is it. And I've worked with people who are on both ends of the spectrum. Um, and I, I think for SLPs, it's really important to understand that, uh, well, I think we all understand that it's hard to use the techniques all of the time but to um, really understand that it's the person I work with. It's their choice in the end what they want to do. And my job is to give them the best possible in training in terms of techniques and the best possible in terms of attitudes about accepting oneself, uh, about doing the things that you're doing, make, you know, ordering your food whether or not you know, it's hard or not hard, you're doing it. You're taking over your life. You're taking control and responsibility for your life. So 
you're a perfect model for what people need to do. Uh, and my advice would be to follow, <laughs> <laughs> follow Sophie's model, please. Um, and also know that it's a process. Change and success don't just, they're not there immediately. Often, I think what happens, certainly in my life, is I realize in retrospect that I've made the change. And I go, oh, wow, I'm not feeling anxious about this anymore. Wow, when they said that, I didn't respond with anxiety. I just said, okay, that's what you think. My opinion's a bit different, but you know what? It's okay. We can have different opinions. Um, so it's often, you know, change takes time. And my experience with clients who are working to change their thoughts and beliefs, so that's the cognitive behavioral part to therapy. We have speech techniques. We have what we call the cognitive behavioral part where you're dealing with your attitudes and your emotions. Um, change takes however long it takes for each individual. But my experience is generally about two years of really working with your thoughts, really working with facing your fears, really working with uh, not avoiding. It takes about two years for it to get really solid, really so really stable uh, that you don't have to think about it so more. It's more, oh, I have to order? Okay, I'll order. So it's a process, and understand that change is a process. Um, and then I think, um, just more broadly, I would say to anybody, someone who stutters, someone who doesn't stutter, someone who, uh, you know, has um, other kinds of challenges in their lives, or not, we all have challenges, so we all have different challenges. Uh, we wouldn't be alive if we didn't, I think. Um, and um, I would say follow your dreams, follow your passions, because to do something that's going to make a difference in life, I think, or different, make a difference for other people, if you have passion for it, it's going to come out. And when people see you doing something with passion, they're inspired. And uh, we all have dreams, and some of them are doable, more doable than others. But, uh, and often, sometimes we don't quite know it's a dream. Like in your life, you know, you wanted to start in medicine and now you're in psychology and who knows where you'll go, but you're on a path. And maybe there'll be something in psychology that's really interesting, you know, uh, and then you'll, you'll follow that path. So I would say in general, general universal advice is follow your dreams, follow your passions. You will never know where it will take you. I never, ever, ever, when I was a young speech pathologist, would imagine I'd be sitting in Poland uh, talking with you, that I would be doing presentations, that I would be able to contribute to life much more broadly. And so I think follow your dreams, follow your passion. Then for speech pathologists, I think uh, one of the most important things for me as a speech pathologist working in this field was when I went to my first International Stuttering Association conference. And it was in Australia and I was already, I was actually doing my PhD, but that was my first international, um, oh sorry, no, I'm, I'm wrong. Um, I had gone to the National Studying Association conferences before, but at that International Studying Association conference, there was something that happened that was so huge um, that made me just realize how challenging stuttering can be and how challenging it can be as a listener. And the example was I was talking with a person who stutters in the elevator and he was in the middle of saying something and was in the middle of a block and the door opened to my floor <laughs> what do i do so what i should have done was i should have just forgot about my floor and stayed in that elevator but i was so kind of confused 
I just said, oh, I gotta go. And I left, and then I, outside of the elevator, I thought, I'm a person who works with people who stutter all of my life. This is my career, and wow, I didn't know what I should do there, and it was a powerful learning. I'm not perfect. I don't expect myself to be perfect, but it was such a powerful learning. And so those kinds of learnings we can get from talking with clients, uh, and we can get from going to our local self-help group. You have your local, uh, poly, the, you have a local self-help group here, sorry. I don't know the name of it, and a Celestia one, I think. And so it's really important for speech pathologists to, to, you know, go to these kinds of uh, events and listen, 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 learn. And my experience was so powerful in helping me really understand at a very in-depth level how stuttering affects lives, you know, so that was powerful. So I think the other thing I want to say for speech-language pathologists is that um, Preschoolers who stutter are affected in on the playground, and so some research, the research that I did in Australia showed that definitely they are. So it's uh, it's something that we really need to pay attention. How are those little ones functioning in in kindergarten? And you maybe have memories <laughs> of kindergarten. <laughs> um, and then the last thing I wanted to say for listeners in general, and see if you agree with this. I would say, stay calm. And listen like you would to anybody else. Have patience and uh, focus on what the person is saying. And if you don't understand, say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Because that's the reality. That's what we would say to someone who doesn't uh, stutter, who we don't understand. We say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Can you tell me that again? Um, and, yeah, just stay calm. Listen as you would anybody else. So, what are your thoughts on that? Jeśli chodzi o moją opinię, to ja z wam jąkającym się chciałam doradzić e, tylko jeszcze jedną rzecz. Natomiast e, e, co do logopedów, to chyba nie jestem uprawnioną osobą do tego, żeby im cokolwiek radzić, być może za parę lat. E, natomiast teraz chciałam poradzić osobom jąkającym się, żeby jeżeli sprawia im to problem, jeżeli wstydzą się tego, żeby zrobili coś z tym, żeby zaczęli uczęszczać na terapię, to naprawdę pomaga. Natomiast muszą być świadomi tego, że potrzeba na to czasu. Ja potrzebowałam tego czasu bardzo wiele. Dopiero po 6 latach zaczęłam się na to odczulać i teraz wiem, że, że było warto. Dlatego każdemu i okolicy się osobie mogę poradzić, żeby, żeby zaczęła terapię, a nie będzie żałować. To było ostatnie pytanie. Ja chciałam jeszcze raz bardzo podziękować za spotkanie. To był naprawdę dla mnie wielki zaszczyt. Myślę, że bardzo wiele wyciągnę z tej rozmowy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas. They're important. They're more important to me than my own. Absolutely.